In January 1971, a new submersible was launched and commissioned to the Smithsonian Institution. It was named the Johnson Sea Link after its donors, Edwin Link, who developed the submersible, and his friend John Seward Johnson I. The Johnson Sea Link was a 23-foot vessel that carried a crew of four in two separate compartments. The back diver compartment was designed for lockout diving, allowing two divers to be compressed to the surrounding pressure of the ocean and leave the submersible to work underwater. The forward pilot's compartment was an acrylic sphere with a diameter of 5 feet, providing a panoramic underwater view for the pilot and an observer. An air conditioning unit was installed on the back right side of the acrylic sphere, creating a blind spot for the pilot. After two years of successful operations, on June 17, 1973, the Johnson Sea Link was launched from Edwin Link's research ship, the Sea Diver, 15 miles out from Key West, Florida. The objective of the mission was to recover a fish trap from the destroyer USS Fred T. Berry, which had been sunk to create an artificial reef. The Sea Link crew that day consisted of pilot Archibald Jock Menzies, aged 30, who had previously piloted the Sea Link about 100 times, Robert Meek, aged 27, an ichthyologist and pressure physiologist who acted as an observer in the front pilot compartment, Albert Dennison Smokey Stover, age 51, a submersible pilot, acted as an observer in the diving compartment, and Clayton Link, age 31, a Smithsonian Institution director of diving, who also acted as an observer in the diving compartment. Clayton was the son of Edwin Link, the developer of the submersible. Menzies, Link, and Stover displayed an incredible casualness in their preparations for Dive 130, considering the inherent hazards of the operation. Because Link and Stover were not planning to perform a lockout dive, they were dressed in shorts and t-shirts. Prior to entering the submersible, Meek noticed Link and Stover's clothing and commented to them that it was cold down there. There had been no sense of risk in this dive because it was relatively shallow compared with the 1,000-foot descents the Sea Link had made since it had become operational two years before. Despite the crew's casualness, their attempt to retrieve the fish trap failed. Shortly after 9.45 a.m., the Sea Link became entangled on a cable in the Fred T. Berry's wreckage while moving away from the sunken ship, 360 feet below the ocean's surface. The research ship, the Sea Diver, informed the U.S. Coast Guard of the situation and requested the assistance of Navy divers, but conveyed that the Sea Link was in no immediate danger. The Navy dispatched the submarine rescue ship USS Tringa from Key West. The Sea Link and the Sea Diver crews considered whether to use the Sea Link's lockout capacity to allow one of the men in the diving compartment to exit the submersible and attempt to free it from the cable. This plan was abandoned because it posed a danger of oxygen toxicity to Link and Stover in the diving chamber. The Sea Link crew and Edwin Link, who was in overall charge of the situation, agreed to await the Tringa's arrival. Levels of carbon dioxide began to rise in the pilot compartment when the CO2 scrubber failed. The increasing cold in the compartment had an adverse effect on a substance called barolime, an ash soda compound designed to absorb carbon dioxide exhaled by the crew. Menzies took off his shirt, emptied the carbon dioxide absorbent barolime from the scrubber canister into it, and held it in front of the circulating fans of the air conditioning unit, lowering the CO2 level in the pilot's cabin. The Sea Diver crew calculated that the CO2 in the submersible could be maintained at acceptable levels for 42 hours in the pilot compartment and 61 hours in the diver compartment. These calculations, however, did not take into account that the barolime in the diver compartment would be rendered less effective by low temperatures. 
The acrylic plastic hull of the pilot compartment served as insulation against the cold, but the 8-foot-long diver compartment, composed mainly of aluminum, conducted the cold and dropped the interior temperature. To activate the bar alarm, Link and Stover were forced to gradually increase the air pressure inside their compartment, allowing their bodies to adjust to the change in pressure. And the procedure worked to raise the temperature. For a while, this kept the men alive. The Tringa arrived on scene at about 4.15 p.m. and proceeded to make a four-point more above the sea link. By the evening of June 17th, the internal temperature of the aluminum diver compartment had dropped to near the temperature of the surrounding ocean and was possibly as low as 40 degrees Fahrenheit. By 10 p.m., the absorbent capability of the diver compartment bar lime was exhausted. At 10.25 p.m., Lincoln Stover began breathing from air-supplied masks. Two divers from the Tringa attempted to descend to the sea link, but had to turn back when their progress was impeded by the hull of the sunken ship. A lockout dive by Lincoln Stover was considered, but they again expressed their desire not to lock out, and Menzies and the Sea Diver crew agreed. A lockout dive was considered again at 12.38 a.m. on June 18th, but by this time, Lincoln Stover were too cold to attempt such a dive. They had switched over to a helium-oxygen breathing mixture, resulting in rapid body heat loss. The atmospheric pressure in the diver's compartment had by now increased to the surrounding pressure of the ocean at the sea link's depth. At 1.12 a.m., Menzies reported to the surface that Link and Stover were suffering convulsions. There was no further audio communication with Link and Stover after this point. A second rescue dive from the Tringa was again unsuccessful as was the attempted use of a roving diving bell lowered from the Tringa later that morning. The submersible Perry Cubmarine attempted to search the bottom, but was hampered by an inoperative sonar. Time was also getting critical for the two men in the front pilot compartment. They were using portable breathing tanks stored in the compartment when another research vessel arrived from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. On the afternoon of June 18th, the commercial salvage vessel, A.B. Wood II, arrived on the scene carrying an underwater television camera with a maneuverable platform, a device from the Naval Ordnance Laboratory in Fort Lauderdale. After the camera was used to locate the sea link, a grappling hook was attached to the camera and used to engage one of the sea link's propeller shrouds and bring it to the surface. The sea link surfaced at 4.53 p.m. on June 18, 1973. Menzies and Meek could immediately be removed from the sea link and were transferred to the decompression chamber aboard the Tringa for 90 minutes as a precautionary measure. However, with the diver's compartment still pressurized, any attempt to remove Link and Stover would have been fatal to them if they were still alive. The process of releasing the intense pressure from the compartment required many hours to prevent a rupturing of the bodies inside. Link and Stover were visible through the diving compartment's viewports. They were slumped in a semi-sitting position, but showed no vital signs. The compartment was force-ventilated with a helium-oxygen mixture while remaining pressurized, and hot water was sprayed over it in an attempt to raise its internal temperature. On the morning of June 19th, medical doctors concluded that Link and Stover were dead and the compartment was depressurized. It is thought that the men died before the vessel was brought to the surface. Link and Stover were brought to the Florida Keys Memorial Hospital on Key West, where their autopsies were performed. Both men's cause of death was listed as respiratory acidosis due to carbon dioxide poisoning. Contributing to the carbon dioxide fatalities was the inadequacy of the carbon dioxide absorbent system in the dive chamber, and the lack of suitable rescue equipment was a factor in the inability to provide a timely rescue. With its boxy shape, stacks of gas cylinders, and transparent bubble, the Sea Link more closely resembled a helicopter than a conventional submarine, and these appendages may have contributed to the accident. 
The Johnson Sea Link accident was investigated by the United States Coast Guard. The investigators concluded that the accident was caused by pilot error, possibly due to distraction, and by the whole shape of the sea link. According to the investigators, the submersible's modular construction of irregular shapes, projections, and appendages provided an excellent configuration for ensnarement by almost any type of obstruction. In addition to the U.S. Coast Guard investigation, the Smithsonian Institution commissioned an in-house investigation, review, and report. The report, totaling 121 pages, provided specific observations and recommendations for changes in the design and operation of the submersible. Basic conclusions from the internal investigation were that Menzies and Meek performed admirably, as did the rescue team, but a combination of key engineering and operational decisions contributed to the entrapment and loss of life. Albert Stover, the father of seven sons, was considered a leading authority in the operation of experimental vessels like the Sea Link. He lived in West Palm Beach, Florida. Clayton Link, the father of one child, lived in Vero Beach, Florida. After the tragic loss of his son, Edwin Link spent the following two years designing an unmanned, cabled observation and rescue device that could free a trapped submersible. Despite the accident, the Johnson Sea Link reportedly remained in operation until 2011.